Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I have the privilege of including two wonderful men from Russia. You are in Moscow. And how is the Russian winter? It's cold. I mean, really, really cold. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce both of these fine gentlemen here. I have Mr. Leather Russia 2021, Marcus. Hello, Marcus. Hello. <laughs> and I have Dom of Pigland. What an interesting name. You are a leather sir and an old guard protocol enthusiast. I welcome you both to the program. So let's begin at the beginning. Tell me a little bit about where you're from in Russia and about growing up. Oh, well, um, I'm from a small uh, suburban uh, town outside of Moscow. Uh, during my childhood, my parents uh, moved to Siberia for a couple of years to make some extra money. <laughs> but, but I could not bear uh, the climate, uh, climate then and the brutally cold winter. Yeah. So I was sent back home uh, to live with my grandparents. Uh. Well, on the other hand, I'm a born and bred Moscovite, uh, and I currently live within the uh, Moscow metropolitan area, so I guess you can call me a city boy. Okay. So tell me a little bit about growing up in, in Moscow. What sorts of things did you do? Oh... Uh, well, I mean, uh, surely Moscow is a huge metropolis. It's the capital. So uh, as any, uh, any capital city, it, uh, it's, it's very vibrant. Uh, it has lots of things to offer. I mean, first of all, it's huge. It's one of those cities that never slips. Oh. Like, for instance, New York City or maybe London. Hmm. Um, so it's, um, it's yeah, it's really... Um, interesting place to grow up uh, at, uh, I would say, because, I mean, it's, it's a multinational city, there's lots of uh, foreign tourists, and one does have a lot of opportunity to uh, network and mingle with different people. So I think this multiculturalness, uh, basically, is something which I really appreciate in Moscow. I visited Moscow in 1994. So I think Moscow must have changed a lot oh. since then. Well, yes, I think uh, if you come uh, sometime soon, you would find that it has changed uh, at least a little bit. Um, so. As compared to the Moscow you saw when uh, you were last here. Mm, 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 mm. So, I heard Moscow is very expensive. It is. It yes, is. It's true. <laughs> it's, it's very, very true. Yeah, okay. uh, I think at a certain point, it used to be among the most expensive uh, spots, uh, even on the globe, I think. Yeah. But uh, after some um, economic crises and difference in um, currency exchange rate, uh, Moscow has become slightly more accessible mm. uh, in this respect. Uh, so tell me a little bit about coming out as gay in Russian society. Oh, uh, I think uh, I knew I was gay since early childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I'm only fully realized my sexuality uh, when uh, I was a university student. Oh. Uh, and uh, there was no way back ever since. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, I knew I was gay 
also from the very beginning. Um, I, if, if I look back at my childhood memories, I remember like my mom ha had all sorts of like fashion magazines, you know, around the house, and those had some uh, men's fashion sections. They were usually right at the end of the magazine. So I was really interested in grabbing a couple of those magazines and just staring at pictures and getting fascinated with all those male models. I was like around five at that point. Um, and then I started like watching sports on TV. And my favorites were, surprise, surprise, diving and swimming. <laughs> Basically, those sports <laughs> where male athletes were minimum clothing. So in terms of, like, um, realizing, realizing that I was attracted to men, I think that came in pretty early, I think. Um, and um, in terms of, like, coming out, uh, I think I was, uh, it was quite late in my case. I was around 25. Um, and um, like, just to give you a brief idea of my family, it's, we, we don't really talk about stuff, like in general. Uh, so the only conversation I had with my mom was like, so you don't really fancy girls? And I was just like, no. And she went on like at all, and I said yes, uh, correct. I mean, and that was it, literally. Uh, we never uh, discussed this matter ever since. Mm. I mean, I don't even know whether she accepted my sexuality because we never dotted those eyes or crossed those T's. Uh, but not, not, not in my family. That's the kingdom of understatement, <laughs> as I love to call it. I mean, in terms of friends, like my straight friends, oh. um, I've never told them into their faith, like, hey, guys, I'm gay. I always let them figure that out themselves. And they are usually pretty good at guessing. Um, and maybe that's just an educated guess. But all of them uh, seem to be uh, uh, totally fine with that. Uh, so what, 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 what about you? Uh, <clears throat> my family. Well, and like coming out um, as as, coming as, a, out as a gay, yeah, in uh, Russia. Uh, well, uh, I came out as gay uh, when I was uh, at university, mm. uh, and it uh, turned out uh, a, dis a disaster. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, my family did not uh, accept my sexual orientation. Uh, my mother even uh, tried uh, to fix it uh, and uh, talk me to uh, to a <coughs> psychology therapist. Oh. <laughs> after uh, we, after that, uh, I had the zero uh, desire to come out um, to my friends. Uh, so everything uh, started within the close family uh, circle. Uh, after 20 years, uh, my family uh, never got uh, to accept my sexuality and uh, treat uh, it uh, with respect. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> mm, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think Russian society, uh, it's a little difficult, isn't it? to be openly gay? Well, right. yes. It's not exactly an easy thing to do here, to, uh, to be an openly gay person mm. and an openly gay couple. Mm. Mm. Uh, there are lots of challenges uh, in this uh, particular aspect. Um, and um, yeah, because it's it's really not a hugely accepting society. Mm. Getting back to your earlier question about living in Moscow, mm. I mean, in most of the countries, and same applies to Russia, the huge metropolises or the capital cities like Moscow and Saint Petersburg. I mean, the society it's kind of more 
Indifferent? I think that's the word I'm looking for. Indifferent mm. towards like members of LGBT community and towards everyone. Uh, as opposed to small towns like in the middle of Novo of Russia. Yeah. I think like same may apply to other countries, like compare the attitude in New York City yeah. and like some place like some shitville Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you're right. But tell me about exploring being gay when you were young, when you were in university or when you were in your younger days. How did you find a little bit of gay life? Oh, well, uh, uh, well uh, during uh, my teens, uh, my jerk off pics uh, were heavy metal band posters <laughs> <laughs> and uh, rock music videos uh, uh, like Scorpions uh, or Wasp uh, because uh, so hot uh, men wearing tight laces. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, hot uh, man wearing tight leather is always like uh, an eye-catching uh, picture regardless. Like in my case, I remember like being so, so attracted and fascinated to top looking um, men like film actors or band members, military uniform guys, like you name it. And the leather cloth figure of Arnold Schwarzenegger shines brightly in my childhood memories. So, yeah, like, Arnie made me gay. <laughs> 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 well, certainly he, <clears throat> excuse me, he made me realize I was hugely attracted to leather. Yeah. And the rest was just some of Finland's fault. But when you, when you were a teenager, maybe, or when you were very young, did you play with other boys? Oh, well, mm, I'm not sure what the best way of addressing that. I don't, uh, well, what sort of, like, what do you mean by play with other boys? Like, play in a sexual context? Yes, yeah, sexually. Sexual uh, exploration. Oh, uh, well, uh, there's always been admiration, but I don't think it's, went up to like a real play or whatever like my first like sort of my first boyfriend uh we met at high school so it was just like one year before entering the university mm -hmm. so i think that that was the first uh basically uh um, relationship well i wouldn't call it a relationship now but at that particular point it basically looked like a, a relationship, although it was like like quite brief. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Uh, and then, I mean, uh, entering the university, it, it always like opens up the world for you. Um, and uh, surely uh, at that particular time, there were some gay clubs around, which I started visiting, um, and so did Marcus. Um, so, yeah, I mean, university is the whole new universe, yeah. as it is for, for every man, I think, everywhere in the world. And in, in our case, yeah, I think university was the time when we started actively exploring our sexuality. Tell me about the gay clubs you visited. Mm, well, let's put it this way. There were no leather clubs. Uh, there were no, like, dungeon-style stuff. Uh, like, nothing like Backstreet in London, for instance. No. They were regular gay clubs and regular gay parties. Um, there would be on occasions like guys dressed at least in some leather, and that were the guys I would like go for, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, but... I mean, it was mostly like a dancing thing and maybe hookup thing and, uh, well, a pop thing. 
Um, so, yeah. I, I am curious uh, about the clubs, though. I, we, in the West, we don't know much about these topics. So when you were exploring in these clubs, tell us a little bit about them. They were dance clubs. They were uh, in social situations. Tell us a little more. Well, um, I'm not really sure what sort of stuff I can tell about uh, the clubs because, well, most of them are gone by now. <laughs> uh, but at that time, I think it was mostly mostly dancing um, atmosphere where there was part of mostly dancing clubs. Uh, surely with a bar where you could get a cocktail or some drink. Uh, I wasn't necessarily into dancing much, so I would rather um, hang around the bar. Uh, and maybe watch the guys dancing and see whom I might fancy. Um, so, uh, I mean, my club life was more of um, sort of an explorer and um, uh, like being someone who actually watches other people having fun mm -hmm. rather than actively uh, doing dancing, which I didn't uh, fancy a lot at that time. So for me, it was more of a socializing than dancing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Now, you said that these clubs are gone now. What, what happened? Oh, uh, well, uh, I think a couple of, couple of them might be still around because some of them would close and then reopen. Some of them would close and never reopen. Uh, I think there are different, uh, there might be different uh, reasons for that. Uh, probably most of them are of economic nature. Uh, oh. However, as, the, as I've said earlier, the society is not necessarily accepting. Uh, so especially in the last uh, couple of decades, which doesn't necessarily contribute to gate clubs uh, growing in, uh, in, in numbers. Yeah, yeah. That's quite sad, really. I, I mean, St. Petersburg oh. has a couple of, uh, two or three, I think, nice uh, venues, which are still alive and kicking. Uh, so that's good. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's surely not enough. I mean, there are some gay saunas around. Uh, those, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure how many of those are there, but at least like three or four in Moscow. And oh. at least I know of one in St. Petersburg. Okay. So that's another... Um, uh, basically places people could go, but uh, gay saunas are more for some sexual interaction than socializing as they are everywhere, I guess. When both of you were going to clubs it, when you were younger, were you able to explore sexuality, going home with somebody from the club, for example? Well, yes. What would be the other reason to go there? <laughs> no. I, I think the audience would like to know how the men of Russia react with this. Well, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily sure I understand exactly what you mean. Like, which particular aspect of a hookup in a club do you want me to elaborate on? Well, for example, when you are exploring gay sex for the first time, what sorts of experiences and what did you learn when you were initially exploring? Well, it's an interesting question, really. I've never um, asked it myself what exactly I was exploring at that time. First of all, I think I was exploring myself. 
Mm-hmm. And what stuff I would like, what sort of sexual practices I enjoy, and uh, which ones I do not like. Mm, yes. Um, and uh, at the early stage, I mean, you do not necessarily know yourself. Of course. To be uh, completely, um, uh, what the word I'm looking for, completely uh, in agreement with, your, with yourself or um, know what you're going for. Like yeah. it's more of an experiment at the early stage. I okay. think as uh, pretty much everywhere, at, le- at least it was for me, and I'm sure it was for, for Marcus. Uh, you start playing with people, you basically, uh, you have sex, you have different sort of uh, kinds of sex in different, you try different roles to figure out whichever works best for you. So I think for me, it was m- more of a, like um, an exploring thing. Yes, yes, yes. So, tell me a little bit about Mm -hmm. the first time you experienced a little bit of leather sex or kinky sex. Hmm. First time. First time I'm... Well, um, well, no, I was slightly older than 12. (laughs) Well? Um, no. Well, I think that, like, well, first of all, let's put it this way. I've been a Leatherman for quite a long time by now. Hmm. However, I only mm, started getting into BDSM like maybe five years ago. Oh. I was a so-called uh, uh, happy uh, girl, lucky vanilla leatherman. Oh, I see. So I enjoyed leather. I enjoyed wearing it. I enjoyed everything about leather. I enjoyed sex and leather. Yeah. But the actual sex was like a like a normal gay sex, okay. but in leather. Um, I do remember that um, mentioning that to people I would hook up with. Uh, it would stir different reactions. Uh, a lot of people just didn't get it. Some people would tell me, oh, well, if, 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 if you like it this way, well, maybe, okay. Some would call me, I mean, some gay people would call me a pervert for that. Uh, but, like, at the early stages, I was mostly into, like, a, as I've said, like a regular sex in leather. Okay. Um, so, I didn't uh, explore the BDSM side of sex at the early stages. I mean, I think that only kicked in like five, six, or seven years ago. Oh, recently. And like, like after I was 30. So I had a much clearer picture of what I want to explore at that age. Uh, but as I've said, uh, there wasn't much Leatherman around. And people with whom I dated, they they were basically not into leather, and they would, as I said, just just let me do my stuff uh, without much reciprocity in this particular fetish. I see. If this makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't necessarily what I wanted to, but that was what or that was what. Uh, I could get at best. <laughs> but Marcus, how about for you? What age did you first do leather or kinky activity or sex? Uh, well, I think at this particular oh. <laughs> point, uh, oh, yes. uh, I probably would have to translate him back to you. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, because it would be easier for him to playing this in Russian, if it's that's fine. Even fine with you. I mean, I'm, I don't know how it's going to work out uh, in terms no, of... No, don't worry, video. don't worry. Okay. No, it's fine. Um, no, в каком возрасте ты, скажем так, начал упражнять кожу и секс кожи? В каком возрасте ты начал упражнять? 
30. Well, he said uh, that he was, uh, he was around 30, uh, well, pretty much the uh, same as really. myself. No, not mm, when he started um, uh, getting into leather sex and more intense BDSM sex. Ah. Uh, so I think, uh, same as with me, the understanding of that of something that you wanted, like on a different scale, uh, gets to you when you grow older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. How are you able now mm -hmm. to connect with other leather men in Russia? Well, first of all, we got connected with each other, <laughs> which <laughs> and I pretty uh, sir. How did you meet? Ah, well, that's an interesting, um, very interesting story uh, because we only met uh, like three or four. Well, yeah. A little bit over three months ago. Uh, recently. Oh. Yeah, pretty recently. Um, at the Mr. Leather Russia contest. Oh. So we literally oh. met on stage. We <laughs> didn't wonderful. know each other before. We, we have never hooked up on dating sites. We were never connected on any social media whatsoever. Wow. We haven't heard about each other, <laughs> literally. I mean, like, at all. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that was a wow effect when I saw him and, and when he saw me. Uh, we were the two finalists. At the contest, yeah, uh, and so basically, he won the contest. He is the current Mister Leather Russia. Yeah, um, I only made it to the first runner-up. Okay, um, but uh, as I always say, um, I didn't get the title, but like I really had to get something, so I got the title holder. <laughs> <laughs> very well, he, he's my prize. I'm he's my prize. Right for you. <laughs> for very <season>. good. <laughs> um, so the contest was in St. Petersburg. Yeah. And after we got back to Moscow separately, um, we, like, in a couple of weeks, I think, um, uh, I wrote to him saying uh, if he was interested to uh, to catch up for a drink. Mm. Um, so we had a sort of a first date uh, at restaurants, oh. and it just went quite uh, quite fast from there. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> so that's the uh, answer to your question. How one hooks up with other leathermen in Russia? Well, you have to um, uh, take part in a, in a contest or a competition and take the guy you're on stage with. So <laughs> that's going to be my advice for anyone who want to date a leatherman. I, I, that is a fantastic story. I love it. I am very curious about the contest. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me more about it. How many people were competing? Uh, well, so I had a couple of stages. First of all, you have to apply mm -hmm. uh, for the contest. I mean, it's announced through different social media, Facebook and Instagram and whatever official channels they've got. Uh, and you apply, you send some uh, pics uh, with yourself wearing leather, you um, fill out a questionnaire you, where you uh, basically um, uh, fill out the, the, the form saying who you are, mm -hmm. what sort of uh, background you've got, um, 
uh, what stuff do you like? How long have you been a Leatherman? I mean, like general, uh, general information about yourself. Yeah. Um, then uh, the organizers basically uh, do the cuts within the people who applied um, uh, for the competition, for the concerts. Um, and um, the, 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 the final part, the main part of the contest is the live, uh, basically on the stage uh, event. Mm -hmm. It was um, uh, run um, in one of the St. Petersburg uh, nightclubs. Mm. Um, and uh, another uh, interesting aspect toward this particular contest was that it was actually on the day of the national semi-lockdown oh. because of all the uh, coronavirus uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. The lockdowns, as you know, in every country were on and off and on and off and on and off. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the contest itself was um, scheduled for a certain date and then out of the blue came this sort of a lockdown thing and it was too late to change the date uh, uh. so it was either or either you are having it or you're not having it like this year at all mm -hmm. um so the organizer decided to run the contest um and it like i was surprised how many people turned out how many well, I think like in terms of the audience were like like over fifty or sixty people. Oh, okay. I mean it's quite hard to tell me because both he and I were so focused okay. on what we were doing, of the interviews on stage, on some uh, other activity we had to perform on stage. So we had this uh, the, the tunnel vision yeah. Yeah. of just whatever the the organizers say, well, you, you do this, and then you do this, and then you've got this interview and stuff uh, like that. So I cannot really say I remember the whole thing. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Only because uh, he and I were so focused on, on, on stuff we had to do. But I do remember it was pretty crowded. How many people tried for the title? Uh, I don't know how many applied. But uh, in terms of the um, the final stage, I think there were three. Oh, okay. Who, uh, who uh, basically uh, were the um, people they um, the organizers um, uh, chose? Okay. Uh, one of them uh, won the what was it called? Uh, the, the award, the award uh, by the online voting. I don't necessarily uh, remember the name of the award, like People's uh, Choice or something. Uh, 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 so uh, that yeah. person won the. Yeah, I, th I, I think it was called the People's Choice Award. Yeah. yeah. And um, the rest were the two of us, basically. Yeah. So, very important question for you, Marcus. Maybe you want to explain in Russian. Why do you think? You won. Вот очень интересный вопрос. А для тебя это можно сказать и на русском, а я переведу. Почему ты думаешь, что выиграл именно ты? You never ask easy questions. It's good. Почему ты? Потому что я э, он такой один. Ну, потому что я очень люблю Петер, да, сам кожа. Люблю. Ну почему именно ты из нас двух А, из двух. 
maybe uh, more sexuality. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> he said, he, well, basically, I know, I know. he said that he, uh, uh, he, he, he doesn't uh, really know, yeah. but he, said, he thinks he's sexier <laughs> than I am. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Thank good. you wait, for this wait, particular wait. question. <laughs> Thank you for starting the ball of a family quarrel. <laughs> Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so, you said uh, maybe 50 or 60 people were at this contest. Did people come from everywhere in Russia? Well, there were people from Moscow, there were people from other parts of Russia. I remember talking to a guy from Siberia. Oh. Uh, there was uh, another guy from the southern part of Russia. So yes, it was, I mean, I was surprised hmm. in a really good sense of this word, uh, uh, word. I was really surprised that people came from other regions. Hmm. And I mean, traveling, I mean, Russia is huge. Yeah. If you look at it on the map, yeah. traveling most of the time uh, means flying. Yeah. So you have to take a plane yeah. to uh, come to Moscow or St. Petersburg, say from uh, even like towns or cities in the middle of Russia, let alone the Far East and stuff. I mean, of course. Uh, but uh, indeed, indeed, it was a really interesting and I was really happy to, to learn that people came from other regions for this contest. That was really yes. great. That's amazing, I think. It, it, is, it is very much so. I would be very curious about gay life and leather life in Siberia. Can you imagine it? Uh, hmm. Well... I'm not sure what sort of uh, leather life there is in Siberia. Um, I've never explored this particular aspect uh, geography-wise, <laughs> let's put it this way. Um, I do know that there are leather men across the country. I mean, social media gives you the opportunity to uh, network with people from all around the world, Russia included. And I do have uh, like friends and connections online through social media who I know live like literally in, in, in Siberia or the wow. Far East. Wow. So, I mean, there are all other men for sure, and they exist. I'm not so much sure whether the life as a sort of a community aspect exists. That I would be quite hesitant even to imagine. But yes, surely there are leather men in other parts of Russia, except for the two capital cities. Later, I would like to talk with you a little more about that. Later. Mm -hmm. So, sure. I, I am very curious about the work you can do in Russia as leather men. For example, in Europe, in, in North America, as leather men, we do a lot of charity work. We do a lot of community work. What are you able to do in Russia? Oh, okay. Uh, as uh, Mr. Leather Russia, I want to, I want to uh, partner uh, with the aid uh, center in Moscow. Uh, mm -hmm to run uh, the HIV uh, prevention. Uh, and uh, now you start with public uh, awareness uh, campaigns. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really important uh, to end up uh, the stigma of HIV and uh, uh, educate uh, the community about uh, PrEP, and the importance of regular testing. Is PrEP very common PrEP. in Russia? PrEP well, um, it's 
I mean, it exists. Surely there are. Uh, it's available. There are some. Um, I mean, it's definitely uh, quite an expensive thing. Mm. Uh, there are. I mean, I probably don't want to uh, reference any particular brands here, but mm -hmm. some are quite expensive, and the generic portions are much more affordable. Yeah. Uh, as I think pretty much everywhere. But I would, uh, wanted to add one thing. I mean, it's really important, uh, this particular issue uh, at this day and age, uh, in terms of the growing HIV epidemic, uh, which has been around mm -hmm. Russia for the past several years. Okay. And I mean, needless to say that the uh, existing ban on what they call a propaganda of non-traditional sexual relations amongst minors uh, does block the information and support services to a great degree. Um, and it pretty much undermines uh, any public activity one could do whatsoever in, in, in this particular aspect. But both of us, Marcus and I, are determined to find some sort of a workaround hmm. and try to do some uh, community work, nonetheless, those aspects. Great, great. Now, what the fetishes do you like? Well, my top three fetishes are leather, leather, and leather. <laughs> Only three. It's 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 my fetish universe. I mean, leather is a part of my DNA. Well, in terms of other things, well, I, I would say smoking turns me on a lot. Uh, like both cigars and cigarettes. I mean, I'm not saying it's necessarily healthy for you, but it is a fetish. And it goes really well together with leather, in my <laughs> opinion. Uh, another big thing for me uh, is uh, tattoos and piercing. Mm. Um, I don't, I'm not sure whether that would count as fetish, but Bald and bearded guys make me super corny. I mean, <laughs> if he takes off his mirror cap, he's bald. <laughs> okay. And bearded. Uh, so, yeah. And, well, gear wise, I think like sunglasses is another like a mm, gear thing which I find really, really hot. I think that almost every man looks hotter wearing shades. And it also brings some mystery. And so what 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 about you? What are your main fetishes? Oh I understand. Uh laser uh, I'm sure that <laughs> it's my number one fetish. Uh, uh, but uh, I also like rubber and lettuce gear too. Oh. Uh why not? <laughs> one uh, my uh, one of my uh, major uh, gear fetish uh, is laser and latex mask. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love wearing uh, it myself during play and uh, also have the, <clears throat> the sub wear it. Uh, it gives uh, this feeling uh, of anonymity uh, that uh, turns uh, me on so much. Mm -hmm. As uh, I have said uh, earlier, I mostly uh, discovered my fetish, fetish uh, through porn uh, and uh, the uh, growth of the internet uh, has been uh, uh, extremely instrumental. Mm. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure, right? I think we all, we, we all discovered our fetishes through porn. Probably. <laughs> but how about things like fisting? or flogging, anything oh, well, like that? Yeah, I mean, BDSL-wise, uh, I think pretty much everything goes for us. I mean, we are both doms, so uh, we basically, which 
means we always are looking for a sub to play with in terms uh -huh. of sessions and uh, um, and BDSM play. And yeah, we, we, we do uh, enjoy all sorts of impact play. I think that's the new term for plugin and other uh, other activities. Um, and there are um, and other stuff too, like what well, yeah, piston is really great. It's it, it's it's hot. It's yeah, something mm -hmm. both of us uh, enjoy practicing. Uh, Waxing uh, can be really fun. I mean, all sorts of stuff. There are some practices we haven't gotten into much, but we are really open to exploring new things for us. For and, I mean, together it's uh, it's it's much more fun to 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 explore stuff. For example, what? Well, I haven't done any electro play ever, so I'm not necessarily sure how it works, but I would really love to try. Um, I mean, uh, Marcus, he's a huge well, fan. I mean, you can't call it fan because you've never tried it, but he would really love to try kidnapping. Yeah. Yeah. K well, a KO and kidnapping. I think uh, it's it, it it could be quite fun. Basically, of course, the 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 third party would have to agree to yeah, get yeah, kidnapped, yeah. surely. But it's very yeah, cool. I mean, Why not? yeah, it might be a very interesting scenario to play out. Now. How do you, rather, are you successful finding subs in Moscow or other places in Russia? Uh, uh, don't get me started on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There are issues. I think there are issues pretty much everywhere. Um, like... You know, when you start chatting to people, especially chatting to people online, it's oftentimes, <clears throat> excuse me, goes like, oh yeah, I'm a zero limit sub. <laughs> yeah, everything goes, sure. No limits whatsoever. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, and yeah. when it gets to actual meeting and discussing stuff of what we are going to do, the so-called negotiation process, it's like, okay, I don't want permanent marks. I don't want heavy flogging. I don't want this. I don't want that. I can't stand on my knees too long because they hurt and so on and so forth. So like a huge, huge list of stuff that the person doesn't want to do or haven't tried and has no interest in trying out. So the mm, sometimes the expectations do not necessarily meet the reality. And that, I think, is the most difficult part of in finding a sub. And in our case, like like the sub really would have to like both of us. Yeah. I think it makes it even more complicated sure. because well we, we only play together. We don't play separately. Um and uh, well I mean yeah we had some good and bad experiences so far. We um uh, we had some expectations which were unfortunately ruined and now are finished and dead. But we keep on keep on looking. I mean, ideally, we would really love to have a permanent sub hmm. because, as you've noted, when uh, you um, uh, you were uh, doing an introduction to this video. I'm a huge fan of all guard protocol. Yeah, it's not necessarily something which is a which is well known here in uh, in Russia. Mm. So we do. I mean, we 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 both both of us are fans of protocol, but we do need to educate people. Yeah. We need to educate ourselves of what it is 
what a sub is supposed to do, what they are not supposed to do. I mean, it's a huge, huge science. I would, should probably call it this way. And also, it's a huge investment, investment of your time, investment of your efforts. So, I mean, you can get really disappointed when you start investing your time and effort and it just like goes nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. But we 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 are still on the hunt, so to speak. Uh so hopefully we would be able to find a third person to our relationship with whom we could really have this um sort of um like like old work, old school, old traditional relations between two dons and the sub. Mm, mm, mm. How did you learn about the old guard protocols? Uh, well, um, I should probably mention that I mostly exercised my fetish life outside of Russia oh. in the past. Um, and so did Marcus. He used to live in Switzerland for a while. Oh. So he, would, um, uh, he was uh, like a regular attendant of uh, events on the continent. Of course. Uh, like Darklands, like Darklands oh. Fest, Folsom, uh, oh. Europe, Easter Berlin, Zurich, oh. Pride, and so on. And well, mo 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 mostly in Europe. Uh, on the other hand, I was mostly focused on the UK because I was a frequent traveler to the UK, to London and Manchester, where I <clears throat> uh, basically explored a lot of kink, mm -hmm. which is like hugely available. Uh, in the UK in terms of parties, fetish sure. nights, fetish clubs, like yeah. the Backstreet and stuff. Uh, and uh, I think that I learned about, first, I first learned about protocol from uh, Brew Hunter, who does his master classes in London uh, at yeah. the Backstreet on protocol, on Sega Play. I mean, he's like, like literally uh, one of the most interesting people I've ever met in terms of uh, talking about pro all guard protocol. Um, so I think I started from there and then I went on uh, finding information online and reading books. So it just got really deep into me. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan, and, uh, and, and 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 so and so is Marcus. Mm. So I probably would might mention and uh, that a lot about protocol he learned from me. Oh, 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 okay. Are you coming to Folsom in Berlin this year? Oh, uh, we wish, we wish, okay. we wish we could. Um, well, well, Folsom Berlin, which is in uh, autumn, we'll see if it works out. Unfortunately, yeah, the COVID situation doesn't necessarily make uh, international travel easy yeah. at the moment. Yeah. This also works in renewing our EU travel visas. Mm -hmm. So this is another aspect which, for instance, prevents us from uh, going to Darklands this year, which is in May. Yes, uh, they moved it this year. Yeah. yeah, they moved it this year. I think generally they used to have it in like February. March or February. Yeah, yeah. I, I intended to go, but I cannot go in May. So I will return to Darklands next year. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good to know, because hopefully by next year, the whole situation with the COVID restrictions yeah. gets blown over. And, and I mean, he's been several times. I've never been. I really want to go to Dublin. Oh, it's wonderful. 
It's wonderful. Uh, and, and we want to go together with Kim now as a couple. Mm -hmm. So it would be really nice to, to meet you if we could yes. catch up uh, in, uh, during that class. It would be just fascinating. Absolutely. But so I want to take another step over. Now, what for both of you, what is your opinion? about mentoring in the community? Well, that one is, uh, it's, uh, it's a really interesting question because I think, I think both of us really consider it a really important aspect uh, for the community. So, so what, what's, what, what's your take on mentoring? Oh, mentoring. Uh, I think that's uh, something I really believe in. Uh, I think uh, mentoring uh, is uh, hugely important. Uh, here in uh, Russia, uh, this uh, particular uh, aspect uh, has been uh, totally in developed uh, so far. Mm -hmm. So we really want to start doing programs and uh, events uh, uh, like lecture and workshops mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, old guard uh, masters uh, slave protocol uh, dominance and uh, submission yeah. uh, BDSM etc it's right sharing uh, hands uh, on uh, experience uh, uh, learning uh, for, from other and uh, networking with the community uh, is important. Yeah, I would agree to that because, as I've said, like, um, I mean, um, community work is hugely important. And especially in Russia, when, as we've discussed earlier, the, the society is not necessarily accepting and like there is not much um, opportunity for people to learn. So we've been discussing this issue with Marcus for a while by now. We, as he said, we do want to do some activities like 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 master classes. Maybe mm -hmm. we we haven't yet um, uh, come up with the full um, sort of a lineup of the events, but we do want to do uh some kind of um some kind of workshops yeah uh, and share yeah. our best practices share our experience and invite other people who have uh experience in other stuff so that we could basically learn from each other because yeah. well it's not only educating people who have like a limited knowledge of stuff, it's also important for educating ourselves, like yeah, yeah. talking to, to other doms or talking to subs and yeah. like hearing their part of the story. For instance, when you asked me whether it's um, hard to find a sub, I also know that subs would probably say that it's really hard to find a dom. Absolutely. Because uh, same same stuff kicks in. Like online people might say, "Oh yes, I'm a hundred percent dumb self, like uh, really heavy into BDSM." And in reality, when they meet, it's like turns out to be a verse bottom who would only slap their arse a couple of times, and that would be it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, it goes both ways, and it's really important to talk, and it's really important to listen to the other, basically, other sides. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, there are switches who basically can bring in like a very unique experience when, a, like, a person can be both a submissive and a dom. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, and, and gathering and talking about this together and do, like sharing some hand on experience, explaining people about stuff, saying that like, yes, you, uh, you it, it's okay to be a fetish man, it's okay to be a leather man, it's okay to like 
plugin. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, I mean, educating the newcomers to the community yeah. is also important. Yeah. And I don't necessarily mean youngsters. I mean, a newcomer can be like 40, 50, 60 years of age. Yeah, it's true. So, yeah. yeah, I think that that is another aspect uh, to what we want to focus on in our community work. Will you take the Mr. Russia leather title, Mr. Leather Russia, to, for example, to compete for Mr. Leather Europe? Well, I don't have the title. <laughs> I'm asking. So it's, it's, yeah, it's quite hard to take something you don't have. Oh, sporty um, pants. <laughs> I'm asking both of you this. Do you intend to take it to the higher level? Um, I would. Mm -hmm. And what about you? I mean, you, you are the current Mr. Levin. Yes, Marcus. Do you want to do this? I, th <laughs> I think I would really love uh, uh, to represent Russia at both uh, Mr. Leather Europe and uh, I am in Chicago, uh, but uh, unfortunately, international travel still uh, remains difficult uh, due to COVID travel yeah. uh, restrictions, uh, yeah. as well as getting travel visas to the EU and the USA. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, I don't see it happening uh, happening this year. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 Maybe sad. Can't. It's very sad, really. I mean, one of the reasons I actually wanted to win in this competition, uh, the one which we had in in in, in October, is because the next Mister Leather Euro would be held in Manchester. Yeah. And I'm a member of the Manchester Leatherman. Oh. So it would be my home club, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when, I, when I applied uh, for the competition, I thought, well, maybe, maybe if, if uh, I, um, I win, if I get the title, I could basically <clears throat> attend the Mr. Leather Europe contest, yeah. Yeah. which would be really nice because it's going to be uh, in Manchester but I mean at that point I didn't know that the, the, the travel would be so yeah. screwed up yeah. and the rest so but but in general yes yes it would yes. be really great to um, to further this title to the international scene let's put it this way I, I would love it I think it would be fantastic if you could yeah. 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 It, 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 it was so, really great. So, yeah, it's maybe may it just the, 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 the time and the, the pandemics is not really, yeah. it's not the best one. But yeah, it, it, it would be awesome. It would be really awesome to, to uh, actually to be in this atmosphere of like of those like really grand events, especially the IML in Chicago. I yes. mean, from what I've heard and seen, like bits and pieces of videos online, it's just a fascinating event. And it would be just so, so amazing to even be there. I mean, and, and feel yourself among your leather brothers from other countries. I, I can tell you that people in Europe and in North America are very curious about leather scenes in Russia. We don't know very much about Russia. So it would be very, very wonderful to see Russia, to see you guys coming. Yeah. So what advice can both of you offer for travelers coming to Russia to enjoy the leather scene? If I come wearing my jacket, what advice do you have? Ah, that's a good one. That's a really good one because, and thank you for, for, for asking this question because I actually, I thought I wanted to um, uh, get my point over this aspect and I uh, completely forgot about it. And thank you for reminding me of that. 
So I did mention, I think both of us did, that being gay in Russia is not necessarily the, the easiest thing to do. Right. However, being a Leatherman in Russia is pretty much simpler. Uh -huh. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why. Because the society in this country is pretty naive and I would say uneducated about gay fetishes. There is no perception uh, of Leatherman in, in sort of uh, in the um, in society. So we wear our leather out and about, like literally full leather, maybe minus the mirror cap. Uh, we like go for walks in the park wearing our leather, we go grocery shopping in our leather, we go to the theaters in leather, concerts and restaurants, and I mean, you name it. How wonderful! And there is definitely no problem whatsoever with that one, just because people think that we are either two middle-aged rockers or members of a bike club. Mm -hmm. I mean, people come to us right. on the streets in Moscow and St. Petersburg saying, hey guys, what, what sort of Harley Davidson do you drive? Yeah. And it's a bit, it's a, it's a tricky question because neither of us does and I don't even have a driving license. Yeah. But uh, my point here is that the general perception of a man wearing a leather jacket, even a studded leather jacket like the one you're wearing now, would be like, you're probably a biker. You just got off your Harley or your Triumph or whatever you're riding and going to a bar. Or maybe you don't have uh, a bike in the proximity of yourself because you're going to a bar, you're going to drink and you can't drive afterwards. Yeah. So in this particular respect, it's really easy to be a leatherman uh, outside, let's put it this way, within the um, sort of uh, uh, atmosphere of the town. Um, yes, I think Moscow and Petersburg makes it easier. Maybe in the middle of Siberia, wearing full <laughs> leather wouldn't necessarily fly as well. <laughs> Yes, I mean, like 99% people assume, would assume you're a biker. Actually, like, like you know, the kind of guy who would beat the shit out of gays rather than a gay man. I mean, it's kind of like 100 uh, degrees opposite. Uh, so uh. if you're going to come to Russia and wear your leathers, I mean, please do. It's like going to be a no big deal. Uh, uh. So, Marcus, Mr. Leather Russia, and Dom of Ping Pigland, I'm sorry, I would like to thank both of you for this amazing interview for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Well, thank, thank you, you. Oh, thank you so much. much. We really, really appreciate the fact that we have this wonderful opportunity to talk to you and uh, to, um, uh, it's, yeah, as um, Marcus also says, uh, Marcus says, it's a huge honor for us to be your guests. And we are really immensely grateful to you for inviting us. Uh, not only it's been a great pleasure, but it also helped us uh, in our um, goal to bring more visibility to the Russian leather community, yeah. to uh, yeah. bring Lush, Russian leatherman to the international family of leatherman. Absolutely. And we appreciate literally every speaking opportunity, every interview with uh, uh, people who want to talk to us um, in terms of saying that if you allow me to um, uh, to change these quotes, yes, Virginia, Russian leatherman exists. Ah. <laughs> That's the message we want to bring to the uh, international community and really hope that we can do our best together with Marcus, other Russian, open Russian leather couple, 
to make a difference with our local community and with the international community as well. So thank you for this amazing opportunity. Спасибо. Welcome to Russia, Nazdarovia. And welcome to Russia, Nazdarovia.